Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I hope you're enjoying this weather. I mean, it's well overdue, if you will. So, uh, so get out there and be, be, before you get out and start enjoying some of that weather, especially during this time frame, I'd like for you to spend the hour and uh, with us because there's an issue here on the table that we are very, very much concerned with, and that is the, our education system. It's very, very important that during those formative years, our population, especially of young folks, get the best education that they can get. It's always been an issue, and you know, we've always talked about this on the Oregon Voters Digest. Well, of late, as you note, uh, there were some bills that were passed that sort of made it somewhat historical from the standpoint the governor now is going to be put a, the governor's position would be basically the lead person, if you will, on, on education, uh, both the from, from the standpoint of the superintendent, i.e. superintendent, and are the board, kind of like a super board for that matter. I'm just trying to keep it in sort of a layman's term aspect of it, but it's a, it's a very important piece of this, it. a historical piece. And we need to spend the time to understand what that means to the bottom line, and it is the education of our young people, which is the future of this country, for the state, and whatever. So, as you know, last week um, we had Steve Buell on, who was, as you know, a former teacher and also a school board member of the Portland Public School, and he spent the time talking to what he felt about uh, this, this change. And uh, we're fortunate today to have uh, uh, Ms. Martin, uh, Christina Martin from Cascade Institute. As you know, we've had Cascade Institute on for a number of issues here uh, in the past. But uh, they, they tackled this piece and they came up with, with their analysis of what they felt this was, will, will have the impact that it will have on our youth and education within the state of Oregon and for that matter around the country for that matter. They were, people are going to be looking at, this, looking at the state of Oregon uh, as to what they, you know, basically keeping a cold, close eye, if you will, on what transpired during, the, during a certain period of time. And as you know, that uh, it doesn't start until the, the next electorate. Uh, so, so that's going to be very interesting. But we have, um, like I said, we have Christina Martin here. She, she did an op-ed piece in the Oregonian. Uh, I think it was about last Sunday or so. Yeah. Last, last Sunday. And I thought it was a very interesting one. And so I thought it would be best to have her on to give her the opportunity to articulate, as you know, there are some things like it was an op-ed piece, that, you know, so give her an opportunity to really express herself and, and spend the time to uh, educate you about uh, what the other side, so to speak. We had a teacher on in one aspect of it, and now Christina, who's an analyst, uh, who's a policy analyst at Cascade Institute, uh, because policy, they, they took on this, this issue, and, and so we're gonna spend some time with her and get some feelings about uh, the various issues. I might add that uh, there was a, in the commentary, today's commentary, and I'm talking about July 10th of the Oregonian, there was a piece that was thrown out there, a letter to the, uh, just a little caption, if you will, Schools and Civic Duty by Jim Stenson of Southeast Portland. Uh, he writes a piece in that piece, but I'm just gonna take one paragraph and we're just gonna kind of like start this thing up along that particular line with Christina, okay? And in this particular paragraph, and I'll, and I'll just basically quote it, it says that uh, charter schools and unlimited school choice undercut the public school mission of building communities. Home schools, online or not, cheat students of irreplaceable practice in socializing, the experience that makes civil discourse possible. You understand that? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we start off with Christina and ask her to give a sort of a definition as to <laughs> what does that mean? Christina, welcome aboard. Well, well, first of all, I think it would be useful for to people to understand what school choice is. Yes. School choice is allowing parents to pick the school where their kids go. To go. Okay. Um, it's based on the school's merits rather than just on their physical address. Okay. So there's a variety of different kind of school choice ideas. One of them is charter schools. And charter schools basically just let you um, choose a school a charter school, first of all, let me explain, is okay. a public school, okay. but it is privately operated. Okay. So, so it's, it's still part it's of the still, public It's still a public school, right. and a lot of okay. people forget that. Yes. And a virtual public school is simply an online school mm -hmm. that is, uh, that is a, a charter school. So it's privately operated, but it's still a public school. It's still part of the public school system. Right. Okay. And so um, this gentleman called it a, a homeschool situation. Mm -hmm. It's actually not homeschool. 
what it does is it creates, uh, it allows a family's home to become an extension of public school. Mm -hmm. So a family, maybe a child who has a hard time in a regular public school classroom, who, who would do better in going at a different pace than the other kids in his class might benefit from a virtual charter school setting. Is that a regulated situation too, though, like the public school? Um, yeah, virtual charter schools are public schools. They're public school too. Right. And so a lot of families choose this because their child is either um, very far behind in a regular, a regular public school or because they're very advanced and they get bored. And so that's, you know, I've been reading a lot of um, surveys from the kids mm -hmm. who choose uh, the state's biggest charter school, which is Oregon Connections Academy. And what they, you know, they, they mostly report one or the other, one or the other. The other thing that parents say is that they want to be more directly involved in their kids' education. Mm -hmm. And um, so we at Cascade Policy Institute believe that parents should want to be involved in their education and that, that saying, um, what was his line about, um, uh, uh, you know, Judge Susan. It, it creates community. Right, 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 right. Right. That public school's job is to create community. I actually disagree. Public school's job is to educate kids. Mm -hmm. It's to educate kids, period. And it should be about kids, not about the adults in the system, and not about choosing some culture to indoctrinate them mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. I think parents should be choosing the kind of culture that kids are exposed to. And if they're uncomfortable with their public school's education, um, they, they should be able to have them in a, an alternative, so a charter school or a, a private school if they can afford mm -hmm. it um, or get a scholarship. And homeschool is a, I, a very good option. And mm -hmm. most homeschool families actually, um, you know, homeschool students statistically do better in the long run as far as like involvement in um, attending college and performing well in college and they tend to be very involved in social clubs. Mm -hmm. So as far as, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there mm -hmm. about that, but um, maybe we want to talk a little bit more about the bills. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. but before you get that, as we get, in your analysis of this whole situation, I'm sure from a historical standpoint, you went back in times of like, when did charter schools start? When did these, these so-called well, charter schools started here in Oregon in 1999, and okay. Cascade Policy Institute was actually involved in helping get the charter law passed. Okay. Uh, Cascade was actually founded to support school choice mm -hmm. um, 20 years ago by Steve Buckstein and, um, and a few others. And uh, their goal was just simply to help educate more Oregonians about the importance of education mm -hmm. and school choice being one of the most important issues. So they found that the education system um, could do better and that it most importantly parents um, there were a lot of parents who don't have other options and they're assigned to a school just based on where they live and if that school happens to be a school that's not doing the best job then that's you know that's that's just wrong and so uh, Cascade was founded and started charter schools in order to give those families an option other than the school up the street and uh, I, like I said before, charter schools are public schools, mm -hmm. um, but they came out of this need for giving people an option mm -hmm. other than what's up the street. And what about the qualification between charter school and just a regular day-to-day -day school? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, are they teachers, uh, certified teachers, you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, what's, what's right. So there are regulatory differences. Right. Um, they still have to take, for instance, state exams. Okay. Um, they, they cannot discriminate. They can't be religiously based. Charter okay. schools can't. And um, so they still do have a lot of requirements. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the great thing is, is that they have, they're much less top heavy, so they can have more control over curriculum, over style of learning. So we have, for instance, Montessori charter schools, uh, Waldorf charter schools, um, charter schools that take an approach of, um, of inquiry-based learning, that sort of thing, and just totally different approaches, very hands-on, a lot of them. And so the idea is that right now what you get in most public schools is pretty cookie-cutter. It's kind of like a factory um, factory model, and this, this really turns it around so that teachers and principals have more control over what goes on in their school, and that also, parents have more control in the sense that they get to choose whether or not to attend that school. It's not a school that you get assigned to. A regular public school, parents are just assigned to the to this school based on where they live. This is a school that parents actually have to choose. 
Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Good. That's that's a good that's a good uh, front part, if you will. Now let's get down into the legislation. They, they just recently passed these various bills and whatever. Mm -hmm. First off, let's talk about the kinds of bills that they did pass, and then let's get into quote identifying what they are. Okay. Right. So there were several bills. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the ones that have gotten the most publicity are the Oregon Investment Board, which is just uh, oversight board that will basically oversee pre-K through college. Okay. Another is that now the superintendent is not going to be um, elected anymore, but will become essentially the governor, which means he'll just appoint somebody to that position. Um, and then there's three bills that I'm very excited okay. about, and those are three school choice bills. And this is these three bills created quite the controversy in Salem, and one allows uh, colleges to sponsor charter schools. Mm -hmm. So many states already have this. Minnesota, for instance, um, has allows their public universities to sponsor charter schools. And now, under this law, if OHSU or if Portland Community College wants to sponsor a charter school, they can. And what that means, to be a charter school sponsor right mm -hmm. now, if you want to start a charter school, you apply to the local district where you're lo located. So if someone wants to start a school in Portland, they go to the Portland Public Schools School District mm -hmm. and they send an application to the board. It's incredibly difficult to get your application approved. It takes months and months and months. It costs thousands of dollars, usually because you have to hire a consultant. You have to, um, in Portland, you have to actually do a market analysis of where students will come from. Um, one of the reasons for this is because the school board is nervous that too many kids will come from regular public schools. They the money follows the kids, right? Right. They still do. Right. A good, you know, <laughs> the money still follows the kid, and yeah. so um, there's an incentive there for them to want charter schools that actually attract kids from private school rather than from other public schools, or from homeschool rather mm -hmm. than from other public schools because, mm -hmm. well, it has to do with money. Um, so you apply to a local school board and it takes, as I said, it usually takes over a year mm -hmm. and costs thousands of dollars and it's a very politically charged process because, as you know, things with the school board tend to be pretty political, mm -hmm. their elected positions. And so what this will do is if an applicant is denied by the district, they can now go and appeal to a college, a, a public university, a public community college. And they can ask them, will you sponsor our charter school? So the college will now become the oversight over that charter school instead. And right now you can appeal to the state board, but this is another option that will, prob will most likely increase the number of charter schools in Oregon. Hmm. So they will do that. Any ideas of what areas you know that a college might be interested in, in terms of sponsoring? Well, I've heard talk of, you know, for instance, um, OH OHSU wanting would likely want to sponsor something that would help prepare kids for the medical field, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different ideas out there, mm -hmm. but it, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. And now this law limits the number of charter schools that um, a college can sponsor. Can, right. Right, they one, can only two, sponsor one. one. Just one, okay. At right. A time. So this isn't like it's opening the floodgates. Mm -hmm. It's more mm -hmm. like a foot in the door to see mm -hmm. how this works. What about community colleges? Are they part of that mix? Would they yes. Be part of that mix? Yes. So they okay. will be allowed to sponsor one uh, each. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Right. All right. Then you, you said three, right? What was the other? We went through all three. Of them. Right. So another one of the bills is um, an an open enrollment bill, and what that this is probably the bill that will have the biggest impact the quickest um, starting next school year so the 2012 to 2013 school year mm -hmm. parents will be able to send their kids to other regular public schools without having to get permission from their local school statewide, statewide. Wow. so what will happen is if for instance somebody in Beaverton wanted to send their child to let's just say Portland again because mm -hmm. we're here in Portland mm -hmm. um, if they wanted to send them to a regular public school, okay, if they wanted to send them to a charter school in Portland, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be a problem. That's already an option. So what this actually does is this is going to allow them to um, regular regular public schools mm -hmm. to actually compete as far as that kind of enrollment goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what this will do is it will allow it will allow a family to ask, say, if they wanted to go to um, Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. They could go to Lincoln High School. They could say, um, we want our child to go here. 
And if they're accepting transfers, then they get put into onto a list. Mm -hmm. And then um, if more people apply to go there, then they, they can accept, then they'll have a little mini lottery just like charter schools have. Mm -hmm. And they can't discriminate on the basis of academic aptitude, these schools can't. And they can't discriminate on the basis of um, anything else, for mm -hmm. that matter. Um, but this will allow people to cross borders. So right now, if you wanted to, if a parent wanted to send their kid to a school in another district, mm -hmm. you know, they have to get permission from their local school. And I've talked to so many parents who have said to me they tried this and their district refused to let their child go. So the only way that they could send their kid would be if they moved and got a new address or if they were able to pay to send their child to this other school. And so this, you know, this is... So no residential requirements in this right. case, right? So now a family will be able to choose a school that's mm -hmm. um, far away. So this is, I mean, this is huge. That is huge. What about transportation requirements? I mean, will, will, um, they, will they be... I, if, I, if I read the bill correctly, uh, I think they will have to get their child within the district boundaries. And then, so if if a Beaverton family is sending their child to Portland, right. they'd have to get their child within the Portland school district boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then Portland would only be responsible um, to get the child to school in that them. area, okay. Right. But, but but on the other hand, they still can send that child outside of the boundary, but they would be responsible right. to transfer with their kids. Right. Oh wow! So they can just go anywhere. They want to go to Seaside. Well, and with the too. public transit we have in okay. um, Portland, I mean, it shouldn't be a problem if, for the most part. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a huge bill, and there are. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 2012. Now, for those parents who are interested in taking advantage of this in 2012, uh, they will need to alert the school that they want to attend now. by April 1st. By April 1st. Yes, and then they will get put on a list. And if if the school's accepting transfers, some schools may decide they don't want to accept any, any out of district tra transfers. Um, but it will be much easier now to choose the school that you want to attend. Well, will school be required, well, at least to, to list themselves one way or the other, that their availability, if you will, for tra transfers? Uh, I, you know I don't think so. I think schools that want transfers, though, will list it because this could actually really help some districts. So if they need, you know, if they need a few more students to be able to offer another program, then they could advertise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so only state dollars will follow the student. Okay. Uh, it will not be local dollars. Um, but again, this could make a, a big down, difference. Okay. What's the other one? You had, you had three so the third one um, is the online charter school bill. So I mentioned those earlier. Those are, again, public schools. And what this bill does is it, in 2009, the legislature put an enrollment cap on charter school, on virtual charter schools. Uh, the teachers union actually brought forward a bill, Senate Bill 767, and that bill in its original form would have actually shut down all our virtual charter schools. And there were about 4,000 kids attending virtual charters at that time. And uh, so since 2009, fortunately, fortunately, that bill did not pass in that form. Um, parents showed up in uh, droves, parents mm. of virtual school children. And they were sobbing on the stand. They were crying. Mm. And they were saying, don't shut my kid's school. My, my kid was struggling in school before, and now he's doing so well. And mm -hmm. amazing stories. Some families with kids who had medical problems who couldn't attend school for that reason. And so they, they altered the bill, um, amended it multiple times. Yeah. And what finally passed put an enrollment cap on all bills. Um, and it also added some other restrictions that were pretty uh, onerous. but. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they didn't close the, the schools, which was positive. So they've been looking at this issue since then because the bill also created a task force. And so what this bill that they just passed, 2301, does is it lifts the enrollment cap. So now more than 4,000 kids can, well, 4,100 or so, can attend these charters, <clears throat> virtual charter schools. And, <clears throat> and so... Also, you don't have to get permission um, from your local district now to attend certain charter schools because there's there's one school in particular that had a lot of problems here. It was Oregon Virtual Academy. A lot of families would try to send their kids to these school this school, and their district would not allow them to go. It wasn't treated like a regular charter school, and I won't bore you with the details as to okay. why, okay. but it has to do with the Oregon Department of Education granting certain kinds of waivers from certain 
certain laws. Can, can you highlight any specific area? There's a 50-50 rule with virtual charter schools. There was prior prior to this. So mm-hmm. basically what it said is 50% of the kids attending a virtual charter school must come from within our district, mm-hmm. within the district where the school is located. Mm-hmm. So for, for most virtual charter schools, this kind of negates the whole point of making it virtual. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole idea with the, the beauty of the internet, as most people know, is that it doesn't have physical constraints. So if there's a family that's out in the middle of Eastern Oregon and they only have one school that they have the option of attending and maybe that school doesn't serve their particular kids needs, mm-hmm. maybe it's just not the right fit, a virtual charter school is an amazing option for a family that doesn't want to homeschool because maybe they don't feel qualified or maybe they want the child to be exposed to mm-hmm. other kinds of ideas mm-hmm. or that sort of thing. But what this bill did is it, it totally negated the beauty of the internet and it said, yeah, that's not gonna work. So this bill didn't apply to one school because they got grandfathered in, but did apply to another school. It was a whole legislative mess. It was. Um, it was just a big mess, and it was pretty unfair um, from just a practical perspective because these schools would get treated differently. So the Oregon Department of Education had to grant waivers to um, schools from this 50-50 rule because, you know, if you're in um, SIO or if you're in, if, if the school is found in a very small district, they're, they're going to be limited to a tiny enrollment. So that's the long, long story. The... Um, <clears throat> the, but the bottom line is, is now families can choose um, virtual charter schools without having to get local district permission to appoint. So mm-hmm. once the, 3% of the kids in their district are attending a virtual charter school, they'll have to get permission. Um, but if they're denied, they can appeal it to the state. So that's, that's still a big improvement. Mm-hmm. You know, as we're going through this, your response to this, this whole new situation, uh, let, let me ask you at this point in time, um, what about our present superintendent? What was their posture in all of this, 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 all this political process going on in Salem? Susan Castillo, how, was she there on an ongoing basis? And was it, you mean with the whole package or yeah, with certain bills? Yeah, the whole bills? package, kind of like, you know, just a kind of feel. Did, did she was involved in some of it. I know she supported some of it. Um, I, I didn't. You didn't see too I much. didn't see too much of what her stance was on a lot of these bills. Um, she was, you know, she was involved in the virtual charter school part as well because <clears throat> part of one of the bills actually sent the issue to the state board to look at. Mm-hmm. But again, I didn't really see her involved. I, I she attended, but I never got a feel for where she was mm-hmm. when she was there. Um, so, you know, you maybe you should have her on. I think I think it might be a very interesting thing. That's <laughs> a very interesting thing I would like to ask Susan. Now, let's talk about another entity. I'm talking about, the, I guess, where I'm coming from now is the teachers' union. That's, that's a huge piece, if you will. And uh, it says that the, the teachers' union has said that uh, these bills will create too much financial instability. How do you respond to that? Well, it's just not true. Will it create financial instability for a school that loses many students? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if all the students want to leave the school, that school will have tr- trouble. But that begs the question why do so many kids want to leave the school? Mm-hmm. And how, what was the legislature's response? I'm sure you were part of that discussion. What kind of response, what kind of interaction were you getting from both sides of the, the two major parties on it? Well, you know, you could watch some pretty interesting, pretty tense floor debates mm. on, when these bills were up on the House floor. Um, some people were like me and they were saying, look, parents need choices. These bills make a big difference. Um, with the open enrollment bill, especially, They were, you know, some were pointing out things like, what about a kid whose parents move? Mm -hmm. What if they move from um, one part of, you know, Portland over into David Douglas School District? Mm -hmm. They're right next to each other. Can, should the kid have to be barred from the school just because their local district doesn't want to give them the transfer? Mm -hmm. You know, what if they move a lot? And so this, this will actually help those kids a lot. And so a lot of people were pointing out very, specific examples like that and then there were a lot of people who were saying this is just going to destroy our public schools this is school choice is a bad thing and you know it was pretty frustrating for me because there's a lot of mess about 
school choice. There's other states that have incorporated far more school choice than what we have. And there's been, ever since school choice even came up, the teachers union has had these doomsday predictions that it's going to shut down our schools. It's going to, it's going to leave kids whose parents don't care about them behind and they'll, they'll fail. This mm-hmm. is, this is what I hear. Mm. It's never happened. It doesn't, it just, it's not happening out there. And in fact, <clears throat> In fact, what we're seeing is the opposite. For instance, um, Milwaukee has an mm-hmm. extensive voucher program. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen with that is that um, actually the public schools have gotten better. And that is what happens when you introduce competition is that people say, okay, I, I, I'm beginning to see that some people are maybe not happy. Maybe I'm going to try things a little bit differently to make them happy because parents Mo- the vast majority of parents want to see their kids do well in school. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, these doomsday predictions just don't happen. Okay. But right. what, what about another? I'm thinking about now, I'm thinking about uh, our present school, the largest school district right here in the state of Oregon, right here in Portland, Oregon. And mo- most of our, many of our viewers are, are, <coughs> are from Portland. Yeah. And what about uh, Superintendent Carol Smith? Was she there? Was the lobbyist there? I mean, what, what did I didn't, you feel for Did you see her there? I didn't talking? see her there. No. She wasn't there. Um, I, I didn't see her there, but Portland actually already has a semi-open enrollment policy within okay. its own district, so um, it has its own system of allowing people, well, it did, um, of allowing people to transfer. Uh, so this, you know, this is really more of an issue with districts relating with okay. districts, mm-hmm. but her lobbyists... Uh, I shouldn't say her lobbyists. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll take no, that back. Lobbyists, <laughs> lobbyists for <laughs> school boards yes. and lobbyists for um, school administrators. Um, they were there and they were opposed to this bill. Was that right? Right. So the Oregon School Boards Association and the Confederation of um, School Administrators were there, and they they were with the OEA for, on this. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. There was another thing I was going to add. Well, the teachers union aspect, we kind of got into that piece aspect of it. Did you see them? I mean, did you see the, the, the executive director, if you will, of the OEA there? Did you see any? any? The, the teachers union lobbyist, and their main lobbyist, was there and okay. um, not, not happy about these bills. You know, they've gone on record. Their, their, um, their president, their leadership has gone on, on record saying that they're unhappy with it because it causes financial instability. Um, they have a couple of other reasons as well. Uh, but I, just one thing about the financial st- instability, I, mm-hmm. I want to clar- clarify a few things. Okay. So in Oregon, according to the NEA, the National Teachers mm-hmm. Union, they, Oregon actually spends more than $10,000 per student. Okay. Yeah, on average, it's going to vary. More than $10,000 per student. Right, okay. each year. Yes. And it's going to vary from student to student depending on demographics mm-hmm. and where exactly they live. But for, on average, it's $10,000 per student. That's a lot of money, especially when you consider that the, or the official Oregon teacher-to-student ratio is 20 to 1. Wow. Right. Now, ver, now, charter schools, on average, only get $5,500 per student. Not to 10. Right. What happened to the money that's following the kids? Local money does not follow the student, and generally speaking, federal money does not for charter schools, Local. generally speaking. But it's, it, it's 10000 now, where are you getting that 10000 figure? I'm, I'm, I'm just as a lead person. Well, the teachers union has actually has a report that they issue every year. I also got figures from the Oregon Department of Education. Okay. And I got figures from um, just digging through their statements online and by emailing yeah. one of uh, the assistant superintendent there um, for information. And he sent me 30 years of information. Okay. But the teachers union does it as well. And I like to cite their figure because we disagree with them on a lot. But we do agree with the NEA on this one on how much is actually spent because they actually include more in spending than the Oregon Department of Education. Wow. Funny enough, the ODE does not include their own budget in their per student spending. Really? So right. <laughs> yeah, they include the spending on the district level, but they don't include how much it costs to actually operate the Oregon Department of Education and State Board. And that number is um, well, in uh, one year, for instance, it was about a hundred dollars per student. So we have over half a million students in Oregon. So it's a it's a lot of money. That's kind of money. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, hey, look, uh, this, this has been this has been quite enlightening. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break. And and uh, if she doesn't, I'm, I'm going to have her give an opportunity for a close when we come back. 
and then we're going to open up the line. If, if that's okay. Is that okay with you, Kim? It's fine with good. me. Okay, good. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back again to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Again, we're we're talking to uh, Cascade Policy Institute policy analyst Christina Martin in the whole issue of uh, this historical deal that we have here in the state of Oregon, talking about the Alway education system. Okay, uh, we have uh, what, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to give Christina an opportunity to um, sort of close, if you will, and then we're going to open up the line. And uh, I, I, I want to just, just jump right up in here. You know, we're sitting in a recessionary situation. We've got a balanced budget aspect there. People are having some tough, tough times, if you will. And, you know, you, you see this education budget that's kind of, you know, when you look at the budget in totality, and people are saying, what are we getting for our money? And a lot of the kids, especially here in the, in the major, in, in the Portland metropolitan area, kids are failing schools. We're having major, major problems. Young people are all over the place where every time you pick up the newspaper, it's a gang member, this, that. Uh, high the, dropout rate. High dropout rate, English as a second language, as all all these different things. And the, the, the bottom line is, that what, is it, what is it doing, if you will, to develop, if you will, our young people, the good citizens, all the other good stuff. We have some tough times. And so it was costing us. And you, you made mention about some figures. And I was kind of interesting. I didn't get all of it. You said 10,000 in one case, 5,000 here, whatever. So what, what is the truth? What, let's, let's talk a little bit about that before we open up the line. It's actually more than $11,000 per student. Now, the, when you ask how much we spend per student, you will get tons of different answers. So okay. if you look it up on Chalkboard, I think it currently says $9,300. Chalkboard Project has kind of a breakdown of the and what, brief, what is Chalkboard? What, what are they Chalkboard doing? Project, their goal is to make it kind of open up, um, well, the Open Books Project for Chalkboard. is Their goal is to open up things so that people can kind of see how much is spent. But they only include certain spending. So they, they don't actually include, for instance, um, well, <laughs> I, they use the U.S. Census Bureau's information, so I, I guess it's... I'm guessing at what they're including here, mm -hmm. but when you when you look at the ODE numbers, ODE, which the, is? the Oregon Department of Education, okay. right? It looks like they're only actually including more the district level spending. 
So they're not including education service districts, ESDs, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite substantial. That's it's right. almost five hundred dollars per student in wow. some years. So in addition to right on top of what they that ninety three hundred, and then there's other spending. So debt service, debt service is simply payments on debts for things mm -hmm. like um, building a new building for schools, building or maintenance and retirement. Per, yeah, that, that can that can be in there. So okay. it, it's just a matter of what it varies from district to district okay. on what okay. is going to be included in their debt service. But so they don't always include that either because it's not a direct spend but current expenditure. It is money. Yeah. It is money. Um, so if you actually add that all up together, mm -hmm. it, we're spending more than eleven thousand dollars per student. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually learn more about that on Cascade Policy. Okay. Okay. CascadePolicy.org. I've got some nice charts and graphs that go back. Um, to the 1980s, really? and I've adjusted for inflation. I've used, um, you know, I show different figures. So one, I show the teachers union figures, which is actually the most inclusive, mm -hmm. except for they don't include debt service. But uh, I've, I, you know, I can give you a comparison of how okay. people count it. And then I also have information using just the Oregon Department of Education's numbers going back 30 years. And you can see that despite what people say, we have in fact increased spending. A lot of the times people say we're constantly cutting spending per student. Well, it all depends on what you're including and what you're looking at. And when you add it all together, we are in fact spending far more than we were back in the 1980s or the 90s. And what about the graph from the standpoint of whether or not kids are learning and you know, dropout rates? Do you have something that sort of reflects that um, in terms of how much money we're spending? Yeah, there's information on our website if you dig far enough. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to make that more available, but yeah. um, you can actually quite easily see using national test scores. Okay. So um, the national, NAEP, and just look that up if you want to know it. Um, okay. We're pretty much flatlined as far as performance goes mm -hmm. by the time you get to high school. So things have actually gotten a little bit better for fourth graders. Uh, but when, by the time you get to be 17 years old, any kind of progress that the, the elementary schools have seen is lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately we're spending far more than we were 30 years ago and 40 years ago. If you go back further, nationally it's the same thing. And nationally, we the spending has gone up like this, mm -hmm. and performance is just flat. Wow. So, wow. Huh. Huh. so no. the question everybody always says we need more money. Yeah, okay, money is nice, but mm -hmm. what's it doing? Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. And then there's this other piece. I don't know what you all have done. The, the testing, the whole issue of testing, the effectiveness of testing. Is that something that uh, Cascade is maybe looking at? We don't really worry about that too much. I think that, um, you know, for instance, No Child Left Behind. I hear uh, a lot of complaints about No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. I don't like No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's more federal oversight. It's more top-down control mm -hmm. over how things are run on the local level. Mm -hmm. And we want thing, the whole system to be turned upside down so that parents have the most power. We want teachers to have more power in their classroom. We want principals to have more power in their school, but right now there's so much administrative mm -hmm. burden on top mm -hmm. of them that it makes things much more difficult at at, at the most important level. Okay. So now with the with the, with the, this change of the governor's control and then this super board, if you will, the superintendent, you think that might uh, that might be uh, the it's, it's super board sounds more top heavy to me. Okay. But okay. the reason why it doesn't bother me so much is because at the bottom level, the very closest level to the child, the parent, mm -hmm. they now have more power. Okay. And charter schools, one of the reasons why I'm excited about charter schools is because they they do give teachers and administra principals more power at that local level. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to us. We think that they're the ones they're the ones who matter most to kids, not these people in Salem or in Washington DC, mm -hmm. but parents and then their, their classroom teacher, really, they, they matter far more. And so we want to see them freed to do their job. And they're getting less money for student. Well, yeah, where's the, well, the question is, is where is the money going? If we're spending more than $10,000 per student, mm -hmm. where is all that money going? Hmm. Interesting, interesting. There's a, uh, the teacher-to-student ratio in Oregon is reported to be 20 to 1. I don't, Teachers should be getting paid a little bit better if things are actually going to the classroom, but it's obvious that there's a lot going to a lot of other things mm -hmm. that in for most people, we don't value those other things so much as we value that classroom experience. Money's not going to the classroom. Okay, let's open up the line here, okay? Let's open up the line. You, you've got the number on, the, on your screen. Uh, give us a call. 
And again, let's be clear, be short and, and right to the point, ask the questions, and uh, we'll see if we can get Christina to respond to that. We'll have a discussion on it, okay? So, okay, so give us a call. Again, that's 503-288-4442 or 503-288-4448. Give us a call, and uh, do, we, we're looking for feedback. That's exactly what we're looking for. So let's talk about your clothes now. What are some of your, were there any other points that you think we, we, should, uh, we should talk to that, uh, that occurred during your analysis of this particular issue? Um, like the good points that you, we talked about all of the, the positive. Is there anything from a negative standpoint that you think something you think might need to be need to be adjusted, if you will, as time goes? Or right. Like? There's there's many things that need to be adjusted. So things are still far too top heavy. I think one controver <laughs> one controversial thing that I ha didn't really talk about in the op ed um, is that actually the um, the it's online terrible. school bill actually allows 5% of these online school teachers to be out of state. Mm. That's pretty exciting. Interesting. Yeah, and the reason why this matters so much is now you could have a teacher in from China actually teaching Chinese to students. So that's wow. pretty exciting. Interesting. Very interesting. But I, 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 you have a phone call, so maybe okay, I'll good. talk yeah, about we'll licensure okay, in good. a minute. Call you on the air. Your question or comment, please. Hey, is this me? Yes, sir, you are. Hey, all right. I have a question for uh, Christina regarding the charter schools. Is there any movement towards making those charter schools a vocational orientated school, like one, say, that gears more towards agriculture or horticulture mm, good, good or point. music or good mechanical point. engineering or environmental issues or something like that instead of just the, the cookie cutter uh, high school education you get to where they're more worried about the amount of credits you get as compared to anything else? Good point. That's good a great point. question. And Thank yeah. you very much, Carla. Good Thank point. You. Yeah, there's actually 108 charter schools in Oregon now. I'm sure there will, there will be more this fall. Um, and there are already some that are, in fact, music-oriented or vocationally mm -hmm. oriented. There's one here in Portland, uh, Leap Charter School. Okay. It's They actually have kids go and do internships and things. It's very hands-on in that sense, and so they want kids to have real-life experience. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different angles that these charter schools take, and mm -hmm. that's one of the exciting things about them. They don't have to do the cookie-cutter way. They can try different things. Mm -hmm. That's a good point he makes because, yeah, supposedly, i.e., the governor's direction, the state or in it, the green. Remember the green and energy yeah. aspect of it? I mean, you know, there's an opportunity there to put those, uh, put those pieces together. Charter school. <laughs> charter school and energy. Or if not that, the agra business. Yeah. After, uh, trying to figure out uh, how to educate um, most of our, our kids about the, the agra business aspect of it and maybe uh, offset some of the problems that we're having trying to get folks to be a part of agra business, making sure they can pick up those crops and things of that nature. Right. And I've heard, actually, this is a really interesting thing. So. There's something called a one school district. So that's a district that's small enough that they literally only have one public school. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of these districts, 11, last my last count, um, have actually converted their one public school into a charter school. Great. And they do that because it allows them to try a lot of different things. And one thing is 50% of their teachers um, can now be non-traditional mm -hmm. teachers. So mm -hmm. whereas currently, you know, they pretty much all have to be uh, teacher certified mm -hmm. by our state mm -hmm. um, TSPC. Um, they can now actually be from from the communities. So mm -hmm. if you wanted somebody to come into your tiny little school and teach, um, you know, farming, mm -hmm. agribusiness, whatever, yeah. or constitutional law, if there's a lawyer in town who knows something about that, mm -hmm. you could actually bring them in to teach a course, which is really an exciting opportunity. Um, but that's, so that's, that helps, that's and that's one of the many perks that these schools have when they become a charter school. Oh, great, 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 great. Okay, so let's let's talk about some of those other pieces you're talking. Is there anything else that you think we might should hi we should highlight a bit, bit more? Uh, um, I'm sure there's I'm tons of things I can yeah. think of. Um, yeah, you know, one thing I, I I could mention is there's been many studies done on vouchers. Okay, vouchers. Okay, vouchers. that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, that's so charter schools, uh, we like charter schools. I like charter schools. Uh, but, but what, what's a voucher? What, uh, but, but but charter schools don't go far enough for choice because okay. they're you know what if, what if there's somebody who wants to send their child to say um, Jesuit high school or the Montessori okay. school at the street? Okay. Uh, what why should they? Why should a parent have a big tax burden? Um, 
And, you know, they could send their school to, they could send their child to a school and have the, the state pay for that. Why, why not allow them to keep a, some of their tax money in, in order mm -hmm. to send, make the, another option to ch send their child to a private school? You know, what's the difference? Why does it matter whether they send their child to a traditional public school or to a private school? And for a lot of middle class families, they can't make that option. And for low, low income families, I think there should be an opportunity scholarship program. So it's similar to a, a voucher, mm -hmm. but it's more um, tax credit funded. So you could have, you could offer tax credits to people who give money to this. And that kind of keeps mm -hmm. the government out of it a little bit and actually can there's perks to that for mm -hmm. the schools anyway but vouchers basically just allow kids um, to take state money and go attend a private school now in Oregon there's some constitutional difficulties because we have something called a Blaine amendment but these other tax credit ideas al allow families to still make those same choices without that and there's been a lot of studies done on vouchers vouchers actually have um, 17 out of 18 studies, empirical gold standard studies on voucher programs, have shown that they actually improve the public schools. Mm. And the the one study that didn't show anything, it actually said there was no difference. So, so 17 said they improve it. One said there was no difference. And these are the best studies out there. Mm. Um, gold standard is basically where you you have a control group so if you were to have a hundred people try to get these vouchers they all get tossed into a hat let's say you only have 90 vouchers to give out mm -hmm. or 50 that for easy math mm -hmm. so you only have 50 vouchers to give out well they follow the 50 kids who get those vouchers and they follow the 50 kids who do not and they're mm -hmm. they're pulled at random so it's a randomized study mm -hmm. and they see what happens to these kids and um what they found is in the vast majority of studies i think it's nine out of ten now have shown that uh, kids actually do better if they get into their school of choice. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean these schools are better. Mm -hmm. They may or they may not be. You know, it depends. But it does mean that it is a better fit for those particular kids. So there's many kids who have attended great schools who it's just, it doesn't work for them. Maybe, maybe they belong in a Montessori school. Maybe they belong in a religious school or, um, you know, a Waldorf school or something mm -hmm. like that. But these studies have all shown, you know, by and large, that kids do better. And so you can actually see a, a great study on that at the Foundation for Educational Choice website. Okay. And they've, they've got a, a wonderful um, booklet that they've made that shows very easily these studies and explains why these are the highest standard studies and why this isn't just people picking and choosing random studies mm -hmm. to make vouchers look good. But I would like to see tax credits here in Oregon do a similar thing for families because I think that ultimately um, this is what parents want. In fact, we had a, a poll <clears throat> a poll conducted with the Foundation for Educational Choice. We, we partnered with them to release it, and they hired the same people who do polls for Time Magazine and Fox News and all of these different groups, and they found that 44% of parents in Oregon wanted to send their kids to a private school. But most, you know, only about seven percent do. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point because you imagine, you know, uh, you're a parent and um, uh, you know you're seeing the situation. Kids aren't graduating, all kinds of problems, if you will, and this, this, that, and the other. And so, hey, look, I'm going to take my kids out of that environment. If you've right. got the money, you can do that. Right. If you don't have the money, you're stuck, so to speak. And then they come through this transition, if you will, of the charter situation and whatever. So let's get together and put together a school. I'm just giving you kind of a yeah. person. So boom, now I've got the school going, if you will. That's fine, too. And then I'm thinking about uh, the, the folks who were able to actually take their kids out and send them to private school. Guess what? That, in all due respect, that's the top of the of the group, if you were the top of the class. In some and cases, the, in yeah. some cases. But my point is, lawyers and you know the, the the highly professional kinds of a folks aspect of it. But if you give them the opportunity, i.e., to address the money situation, and allow that, i.e., the money to follow the kid, if you will, then all of a sudden those kids can socialize, get involved with those those parents' <laughs> kids at that level. And all of a sudden, you know, you you at their homes and whatever going to parents with lawyers and just that and doctors and the like and get that exposure because that's what it's all about because people who are in that on those kind of situations are very responsive they really respond to their kids to make sure that they understand what this is all about they understand 
And so my point is that when, when, when the, I was thinking about the article about socialization aspect of it, right. so I think the idea of, yeah, why not? They pay taxes too. Give right. them the opportunity, if you will, uh, to, uh, to, to, but when, when they open it up, the private school, to just the average person, if you will, then no problem. And then they'll be more receptive, if you will, and saying, okay, fine, they can come to this school too, right? Fair? And then puts more pressure on the public school to say, okay, fine, we got to do something to blah, blah, because that's why we're losing the money. Right? That's more or less what happens. And I just want to be really clear about something. Um, I'm not anti-public school. Oh, no. I'm not anti-public school teacher. You're pro-kids in education. Right. And the thing is, is there's a lot of excellent public schools out there. Oh, no. there in fact, we have one of the best public high schools in the nation in Corbett. Tiny hmm. little Corbett really? High School. Yes, it's why is that so? top ten. Why is that so? In Corbett. Yeah, because they had a superintendent who said that he was going to demand more and try to do things out of the box. And mm -hmm. they, they approached things very differently. Like what? Um, you got me going now. Well, you know, I talked to him about this, uh, what was it, a couple of years ago. You okay. should have him on here. Okay, you know, good, he can you know. he can explain it better than I can. But Let him know. Basically, well, he, now he's a former superintendent. He started he's a, a former. Wait right. Minute, he minute. started a charter school in Corbett so that kids from out of district could attend the Corbett program okay because they were having problems with neighboring districts refusing to let kids transfer yeah they said we want to keep the money we don't want that state money following that kid we want that money <laughs> we're not letting them transfer and so they were running into that as a problem and so they created a charter school and paired it right up next to their regular public school program okay. and it's on the same model it runs in the same manner for and the most working. part and it's working great and where's the guy now where is he he's running the charter school now well, he's running the charter school right wow and um, his name is Bob Dunton. You could invite him we, on here. We get him he, on. Yeah, but they decided to do things in a different way. They they don't treat kids as though every nine year old is the same. They they don't label them in the same way. So, you know, you can have one nine year old doing um, seventh grade work and another, you know, doing lower work and all in the same great you wow. know so they, they do things differently and what about that, class size and things like that so oh their classes are very their their total school size is very small so mm -hmm. k through 12 total i think it was 900 last i i saw so that's mm -hmm. very small when you start breaking it dividing mm -hmm. 900 by 12 mm -hmm. that's less than 100 per grade level so it's a tiny district but they've done a lot and they've had more um more kids taking ap classes and and passing a, ap exams than most large districts have hmm. so um, the higher percentage. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. So they're, 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 they're ranked right. by Newsweek. You can look it up, but you should have him on. Well, that'd be a good deal. Well, look at we, we've got a, we've got about another eight minutes or whatever. But I was just thinking, about, by the way, if if you're still interested in calling, you got some time. Give us a call again at five zero three two eight eight four 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 two or five zero three two eight eight four 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 eight. Okay. I mean, Christina is really just breaking it down. I think it's good. We had Steve Buell the, this past week and whatever, and and that's what we want to do. It's it's about kids, and uh, and at the same time, from a taxpayer standpoint, what are we doing with the money? Right. It's the responsibility of the money, but but primarily, it's about the kids. Whether you spend five thousand dollars a child or ten thousand or twenty thousand, I think the public and the taxpayer are interested in one thing: what are they what are they turning out? Right. Are you turning out good citizens, if you will, and folks who are going to be contributors if you're to our society but not looking at the criminal justice system where where we're, sp we're spending all kinds of money you've been seeing the headlines on the criminal justice system all of a sudden you know it, it's, it's more tax money we got the education system on one side and we got the criminal justice system on the other side. and I think there's a tie-in because in all due respect if, if the majority of those people were educated if you will and contributors to society right. we'd be in a far better situation a far better fix so so anyway christina any lasting comments here we've got a, a few more just about four maybe four or five minutes you know as i said there's a lot of great teachers out there and i i this isn't teachers that we're against we're not against teachers in okay. fact Good. uh the u.s department of education has a reach research group ncs and they have conducted studies looking at who's happiest public school teachers versus private school teachers, yeah. um, charter teachers. What they found is people who work for private schools are far happier than t pu re regular public school teachers. Mm -hmm. They report that they have more influence over what's taught, how it's taught. They get a role in choosing the curriculum. They feel that they're treated like professionals. They feel that they're treated well. And now what's amazing is that private school teachers are unfortunately paid less on average here in Oregon. Mm. And I would like to see that changed. but. Mm -hmm. Um, 
<clears throat> but the bottom line is, is that they're happier, not because they're getting paid better, but because they're actually getting to use more of their skills and talents and mm -hmm. and they feel more professional freedom and so I this is school choice is not something that's just about kids it's actually also about teachers and encouraging teachers and schools and individuals to use what they're best at yeah. to do what they're best at rather than letting people at the very top tell them how everything should be done at yeah. the bottom look like we've got a call we got a caller here calling you on the air your question or comment please I just have a comment on charter schools and vouchers in general okay and that is, I'm, I'm 60 years old, mm -hmm. and when I was growing up, um, everyone complained about school taxes, but they never got defeated, in, well, at least where I grew up. They always passed. Okay. And so we didn't have these large class sizes. I went to public school, and I also went to parochial school. Mm -hmm. The public schools were much better then, and I find it insulting that charter schools take tax money away, mm -hmm. because to me, when I went to a private parochial school, my parents paid for that, and they also paid their taxes. And that was the way it was done, and in my opinion, that's the way it should be done. Okay. Public schools are there for the public. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I just want to hear, hear that said out okay. loud, okay. because the vouchers and the charters, they seem to be the be-all and end-all these days. Okay. That's all. All right. Thank you very much, Carla. Well, I think that your parents should have gotten a tax credit for... <laughs> for sending you to a parochial school. I think that um, that choice should be worked with. It, it, your parents already had uh, the difficulty of paying those taxes and paying tuition, and I think that um, they should at least get some kind of tax break for sending you to a private school. And I'm about public education. <clears throat> public education means educating the public. Does it matter where the chi child is educated? So that that would be okay. my main Let's response. take another call. We can probably spend a little bit more time no, no, on that. No. You got another call? No. That's about the size <laughs> okay. of it. Okay, fine. You got go. what, about one more minute to go? Right. Okay, well, look, I guess we're, we're at this point now is that um, I'm sure that uh, people were listening out there. We probably would have had more calls, but this time we were, we were trying to get the information out, and I think it's very, very important mm -hmm. that we do that. And um, you've got uh, Christina's uh, email address, and she'd be more than welcome, if you will, to answer your questions, right? Fair? Is that fair? And uh, this is a very important subject, so keep your mind open, and, because it's the bottom line is about the kids, it's about the youth, it's about our future, as I've indicated to you before. Very, very important. The cost is constantly going up, and, uh, and a lot of times uh, uh, the, the education, if you will, of our kids is constantly looking like it's going down, and that's the thing that bothers me. The criminal justice system is going up, and, there's, and, our, and the kids are just losing out, if you will. So uh, what we're going to do now is that we're going to probably... Uh, Maybe the entertain getting the um, the OEA on, get the OEA on, get the person, the superintendent you're talking about. Why is he doing such a better job? But he has a charter school or whatever. But we're going to stay on this particular subject. Again, thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Christina, for Thank being you. part of it. And we'll see you next week. As George Page always said, back to what you believe in. Have a good one.